Hey, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Foundations. It is Friday morning once again. Thankful for another Friday that we can be together. Thank you for joining us this morning. Glad to have you joining us here on Foundations, where we are setting a foundation of faith, and that foundation is Jesus Christ. As Paul said, there is no foundation laid except that which was laid, which is Jesus Christ, and then we build upon that with the things that we do. So welcome to Foundations and thankful to have you with us. Hope your uh, morning has been fairly decent. I know mine has been a little bit slow. I'm uh, like most people with this change of weather up and down. We went from like 80 degrees down to 65 yesterday, something like that. And today we're going back up to 75. And I know some of you have seen um, 85 one day and 45 another and some of the other uh, regions of folks that are listening. So uh, just just to hang in there, I'm sure that somewhere down the road, there's going to be two days that's going to be the same temperature in a row. Uh, although in the Hoosier State, I'm not sure if it's going to happen. Now, there may be some weather forecasts that tell me differently, but I only believe the weather forecast as it actually happens. So that's it's a tough thing, but we got to take it as it comes. Um, you're much better off if you're ready to take it as it comes than you are with your feet planted. Um, anybody who's ever done any wrestling or boxing knows that, right? All righty. Actually, baseball, too. So if you plant your feet, you're liable to be flat-footed, and, well, you don't need lessons in baseball. So, hey, again, thanks for coming this morning. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for tuning in. So let's jump in. Let's get to the question of the day. Each week, I have a question for you. And so here's the question of the day, and here's what I want you to share down below in the comments, and let me know this. In your current season of life, where you're currently at, which do you prefer at this point in your life, a staycation or a vacation? Which do you prefer and then why? In your current season of life, in your time currently where you're living in your life, which do you prefer, a staycation or a vacation and why? So just comment down below. Let me know what you're thinking. I would love to hear what you think is better. I like both. But there are times when a staycation sure is a great thing, right? Um, all right. So I'm guessing this morning as we kick in with this morning's topic that each of you are possibly as guilty as I am of this one sin. This one sin, this kind of finalization of the series uncluttered, the, the kind of the nail that finishes everything off today, this one sin is so prevalent that you and I probably don't even realize that it's there. As I said in my little promos, it's not on your radar. <laughs> yeah, Radar O'Reilly, for those of you who caught in, uh, caught, uh, caught on to my little play on words. And as I had said in the other promo, yeah, I'm just better than you are. There's some words there we're getting ready to address. So um, let me tell you, when I trip up on this little thing, it becomes a big thing. And I know I have been in places where I've not guarded my heart against it, and I have fallen into this behavior. And when it clutters up my message or your message, it clutters up the message of the gospel in a way that creates a place where people do not see the story of the Savior, the Savior who lived, who loved, who died, who rose again, and now lives, and lives for you and I to have intercession with the Father and have eternal life. And so if I'm not careful, I will find myself in one of these two stories that I'm getting ready to share from Scripture. Here we go. Let's jump in. The first one is from Matthew chapter 23. Here's the first story I can find myself in and possibly you could find yourself in. Matthew 23, this is what it says. What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law and you Pharisees? Hypocrites. For you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens or herb gardens, depending upon where you're from. But you ignore the more important aspects of the law. In other words, you tithe on little bitty things, making sure you keep the law, but you really miss out on what's important. And here's what Jesus said are the more important aspects of the law. Justice, mercy, and faith. You should tithe, yes, but do not neglect the more important things. Blind guides you are. You strain at water so you won't accidentally swallow a gnat. But you swallow a camel in the process. That's found in Matthew chapter 23. 
Luke 18 says this, and this is another story I can find myself in. It may not play out the way this one did, but the attitude is still there. Here we go, Luke 18. Then Jesus told this story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everyone else. Two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a despised tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I am not like other people, cheaters, sinners, adulterers. I'm certainly not like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of my income. But the tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even lift up his eyes so heaven, uh, to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, O oh God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. I tell you, this sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those that humble themselves will be exalted. Wow. What difficult words, and yet what close to our hearts, kind of the old phrase as I use it, close to the skin, those words are. So I want to jump in and I want to challenge our hearts this morning. And I want to talk to you about the most common items that clutter our message when we're trying to share Christ to the way we leave. And you and I have this unbelievable knack of falling into this land of memory loss, to this big black hole of memory loss. And I'm not talking about Alzheimer's or dementia. I'm talking about spiritual blindness where we find where we find ourselves falling into a loss of memory when it comes to our spirituality. I'm talking about what I call the I'm good syndrome. You want to know what the symptoms of the I'm good syndrome is? Well, number one, time. Yes, time, simply put, is not really on our side. We think it is, and unfortunately, it becomes the one thing that creates one of our biggest temptations. I have, at this age in my life, um, found myself, if I'm not careful, thinking that younger believers are not seasoned and therefore not worthy of consideration when they tackle me or test me on one of my time-tested beliefs. See, here's what's true. If what you believe is true, whether you're at my age or whether you're at 21, it's true. And so if someone who's younger has truth and you're playing games because you have your truth, you've added to God's truth, then that's a symptom of this problem we have talked about and named by me as the I'm good syndrome. The second symptom of this um, situation is this. We really do forget who we were. We do. We forget who we were. And as a result of that, we forget that we were and are sinners that are saved by grace. To think differently is to fall into the sin of the Pharisees. I love that old song. And in a few minutes, I'm going to share the lyrics of it. It's called, I'm Just a Sinner Saved by Grace. I'm going to share that in a few minutes and the lyrics to it. You're not going to want to miss the lyrics to that song. The third symptom of this I'm good syndrome is this. I begin to think that God loves me because I'm valuable to him. Or we begin to think God loves us because we add value to him. That you've actually reached a level of faith, that you've reached a level of practice, that you are so lovable because of what you bring to God. That he loves you more because of what you've done or because of the way you've lived or how holy you are or how wonderful your words are or how deep your knowledge of the scripture is. You see, those are all characteristics of the Pharisees. Yes, they are. And unfortunately, we begin to think that we are Christians because of who we are, not because of whose we are. And it's so easy to fall into that trap that you think that by your value, you've added something to God and not realize that you do not add value to grace. You need to understand that your moral compass is not making you more holy. Only through your own submission 
and obedience to Jesus Christ and his work of his Holy Spirit in your life do you even become anything, let alone more holy. And nothing could be farther from the truth when you think that you are adding value to God. Listen to these words from Jesus. We said them, and they're from the previous passages. You are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens, but you ignore the more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. Let me say a couple of things here real quick, like, and then I want to read from Isaiah. Listen up. When I use the word justice, I'm not talking about social justice. There's a difference between those two. There's a difference between biblical justice and social justice. I'm not going to take the time here right now to address that, but don't hear social justice when you hear God say justice. Secondly, mercy. Mercy is something that you give to folks that they absolutely can't even begin that you've done, that you've let them off the hook because of your merciful behavior, and that's what God is. And then faith, and faith is very simply put, this one word, trust. Faith is trust. And so when you begin to believe that what you trust in God and the way you've trusted in God and the fact that you've trusted his son for your savior, when you begin to believe that that is no longer the reason that you are growing in your spiritual walk and you begin to think it's something you've added to it, you have fallen into this trap and you are a victim of the I'm good syndrome. Listen to Isaiah as he says these words as he opens his heart up before God. You welcome those who gladly do good. Talking about God welcomes those who gladly do good, who follow godly ways. But you have been very angry with us, for we are not godly. We are constant sinners. How can people like us be saved? We are all infected and impure with sin. We, uh, when we display our righteous deeds, they are nothing but filthy rags. Hear those words again. When we display our righteous deeds, they are nothing but filthy rags. Like autumn leaves, we wither and fall, and our sins sweep us away like the wind. I'm telling you, some of you, your testimony for Christ has been swept away like the leaves. They've withered and fallen and blown away like the wind because you have decided that you are good and then therefore add value to God. Listen, you are not good, and then therefore you are not adding to God's goodness. You are not righteous, you are not holy, and nothing you do is. Only his work in you actually changes you. Which leads us to the last symptom of I'm good syndrome. Those who are in tune with God as I am. Here it is. For those who are in tune with God as I am, it's because they do or they go or they pray, or they worship like I do. My church does it the right way. My church knows the right songs, the right music, the right scripture, the right revelation, the right translation. My church, me, my worship, my things. Let me tell you what God wants because I have it and you don't. It's what I call the have and have not theologies. What really broke this in my life a number of years ago was when I had time to spend with a missionary that was a friend of mine by the name of John Galindez. John was a medical doctor that stepped aside from his medical practice and practiced ministry instead more often than medicine. And as he built a ministry, he was able to allow his medicine to be a part of his ministry. There was a lot of things about John that many folks admired, but what I admired about him was this reality. He loved to share Jesus Christ through the things he did. But what was powerful about it is, is how he did so in a way that actually reached out to his home country. He was from the Philippines. And what I found was this, is that the Filipino worship styles were not the same as the American styles. And then later down the road, I met a young man by the name of Kenneth Kenneth El Espana, who was from the Sudan. And I realized one day how different his worship was than mine. And I had to ask myself the question, if worship is different in the Philippines and worship is different in Africa than it is here in my little church, 
Does it mean that my little church might have a problem instead of being the normal? Boy, oh boy, that'll make you think, won't it? You think that people who are worshiping Jesus in the absolutely ungodly nation of North Korea, do you think that those people worship like you do? You are absolutely arrogant to think your way of worship and your translation of the Bible and your way of praying are the only ways. And the only way other people will grow is when they are like me. Whew, man, that's just crazy. And when you're there, you're not in step with the Savior. It's as simple as that. Let me share some words from Max Lucado that I find really quite confronting as well as quite encouraging. But listen to these words. They're from Max Lucado's um, book, In the Grip of Grace. If we confess our sins, the biggest word in Scripture, if we confess our sins, come up 1 John 1, 9, Max goes on. The biggest word in Scriptures just might be that, that two-letter word, of if for confessing sins admitting failure is exactly what prisoners of pride refuse to do me a sinner oh sure i get rowdy every so often but i'm a pretty good old boy i'm talking about christians acting this way not non-believers he goes on listen i'm just as good as the next guy i pay my taxes justification rationalization comparison they sound good and they sound familiar they even sound american but in the kingdom they sound hollow when you get to the point of sorrow for your sins when you admit that you are uh, that you have no other option but jesus then you cast all your cares on him for he is waiting because you believe you don't have any other options you see, when you think you have other options, and those options are the ones you've chosen, you're walking a path known as the I'm good path, the I'm good syndrome. Those who are in tune with God like I am, we say. How sad. How sad. You see, the thing that clears our gospel is the loss of love that you and I have towards those that don't know Jesus or those that aren't as good as us. You see, it's that love we were drawn to when we were sinners. And we've forgotten that love. We've forgotten to put the Savior first. And as a result, we've lost His love. And we begin to practice what we call love, which isn't loving at all. When you and I as believers find ourselves falling into the trap of I'm good, we're really muddying up the message of salvation. I told you I would share the words of this old quartet sung by the cathedrals, A Sinner Saved by Grace. I believe Bill Gaither wrote this. Listen to these words. If you could see what I once was, if you could go with me back to where I started from, then you, then I know you would see. A miracle of love that took me in its sweet embrace and made me what I am today, just a sinner saved by grace. When I stood condemned to death, he took my place. Now I live and breathe in freedom with each breath of life I take. Loved and forgiven, back with the living, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. How could I boast of anything I've ever seen or done? How could I dare to claim as mine the victories God has won? <clears throat> I love these words, man. Woo! Where would I be had God not brought me gently to this place? I'm here to say I'm nothing but a sinner saved by grace. He says, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. When I stood condemned to death, he took my place. Now I live and breathe in freedom. With each breath of life I take. Loved and forgiven back with the living i'm just a sinner saved by grace let me speak very clearly here please listen up if you've not listened up till now it's time you tune in for the next 45 to 60 seconds if you're a believer this is your identity you are nothing more than a sinner saved by grace 
You are who you are because of God's love and because of his grace that he has placed on your life and in your heart. And it never changes. And you need to hear the words of what uh, one of my favorite communicators says in one of his book, books called The Grace of God. Andy Stanley wrote these words. Grace plus anything isn't grace. You see, if it's not grace, then it's earned. And since we can't earn salvation and we can't earn holiness and we can't earn a place in God's kingdom on our own works, we need to understand it's grace that we got through on. Secondly, if you're not a follower of Christ and you're listening today, or maybe you've been in church and you've gotten away, and maybe you've decided your faith has been deconstructed and you no longer believe, I want to challenge you for just a second. Listen up. Do not tune me out. If you've rejected Jesus because of one of us who say we follow Jesus, those who claim the name of Christ, shame on us. But you will not stand innocent before God because of our guilt. You need to stop playing that card. You need to look in the eyes of the Savior who looked in the eyes of the people who were sinners and said, come to me and I will give you rest. Believe in me and I will give you eternal life. And no man comes to the Father except through me. And you need to stop playing games with theology and start getting to Jesus for cleansing and salvation and righteousness. He is the only reason I even have anything, period. I've bet my entire life on Jesus. And the reason I've done is because historical writers who are not Christians talk about him and his life. And the writers of the scriptures and the gospels, they got it right from the horse's mouth. And that story has stood the test of time for over 2,000 years. Stop playing games. Quit listening to theologians who know nothing about Christ and start listening to the Savior who calls to your heart and says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son and he died for you so you would have eternal life. And whoever believes in him, he says, will have salvation. He said he did not send his son to the world to condemn the world. And as believers, when we say condemning things, we're not representing the Christ of the cross. We're representing our own I'm good syndrome. And you need to wake up. Whether you're a believer or an unbeliever today, turn to Christ. Walk with him. Let him change your life. He loves you enough to do so. It is so, so powerful. So powerful. You and I need to realize that the only answer we have for life is Jesus Christ. That his grace is the only way to make it. And I hope that this last story will inspire you to realize how powerful grace is. The story is a young man that during the early days of the Civil War, a Union soldier was arrested and charged with desertion. He had basically run instead of fighting. Unable to prove his innocence, he was condemned and sentenced to die a deserter's death. His appeal found its way to the desk of the man we all know as Abraham Lincoln. And the president felt mercy for this soldier and he signed a pardon. Then the soldier returned to service, fought the entirety of the war, and was killed in the last battle of the conflict found within his breast pocket was a signed was the signed letter of the president himself close to the heart of the soldier were the leader's words of pardon he found courage in grace listen to me may you find courage in grace and that grace awaits you and without it you are condemned but with it you are pardoned And today, you can do something about it, whether you're a believer or an unbeliever. Please, trust Jesus and find grace. It's the only place you'll have any hope. I guarantee it. Hey, thanks a lot for tuning in today. As we close, here's the question. Please comment down below. 
in this current season of your life with the life you're living currently, which do you prefer, a staycation or a vacation and why? Comment down below and let me know that. Thank you again for joining me this morning for Foundations. It's one of the most uh, meaningful moments of my week. I love the time I spend together with you. I love the time I get to share. I love the comments. Thank you so much for the comments and even for the complaints. Thank you so much. I'm better because iron sharpens iron. And let me tell you something, uh, that abrasion is what it takes to sharpen folks. And so don't be afraid to compliment or complain as long as you're willing to grow because you find the truth. Iron sharpens iron. And so one man sharpens the countenance of another. Thank you so much this morning for joining me on Foundations. Come back again next week. Share it with your family and friends through social media. Email them, send the link, or tune into our YouTube channel where you can watch it if you don't do Facebook. All right? Hey, God bless. Thank you so much. Y'all have a great Friday now. Have a marvelous weekend and an unbelievable day off for the holiday. All right? Take care, y'all. Bye-bye.